Good morning and welcome to another week of our Bible study on the book of Acts. We are on chapter 15. Who would like to start by reading verses 1 through 11? Get rid of the home, Sue. Okay, I will. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissensions and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia, Phoenicia, yeah. Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversation of the Gentiles and were bringing a great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. How much farther? Uh, to verse 11. Okay. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. After uh, there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke, which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. Okay, so what, is, what are the issues that are being debated here? What is being argued here? Circumcision. Mm -hmm. The Gentiles. Moses. Yes. What are the laws of Moses that he's, they're talking about? That every male be circumcised. And? That they eat non-unclean yeah. food. Yeah. So we're talking circumcision and dietary laws. These are the main things that they're worried about. So do, now that we've included Gentiles in the faith, do they have to do all these things? And again, for adults, now remember, when does, when does circumcision happen? Eight, eight, eight days old. Eight days old. Um, <laughs> the infant uh, soon forgets uh, <laughs> what has happened to them. Um, but now we have adult converts to the faith. Um, so uh, I think circumcision is a different whole question <laughs> at this point. Um, and, um, and even, you know, oh, here comes Carol. Even dietary things, adding that on at this point. Um, so those are the issues being played out. And some of this we were starting to get to in our last chapter that we looked at was what do the Gentiles have to do? What do the Jewish Christians have to do? And this question of what is necessary. Um, so who are the players involved in, in these discussions? Barnabas, Paul, the apostles and the elders. Mm -hmm. And some Pharisees. Yep, and we got Peter in there too. Welcome Carol. I'm so sorry. Oh, she closed it. <laughs> I think she closed it. She'll come back on in a second. Um, I'm trying to mute or something. She probably didn't actually hit the wrong button. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's easier on an iPad and something like that to, to do that. I'm sure she'll pop in any second. Um, so yeah, so we got various players involved and, and it's coming to a place of who is, you know, where do we bring that authority? And so that's coming into question as well. Um, so how are we seeking clarification? How does the body go to figure out this conundrum? They go to Jerusalem with, with the main guys, the big guys. That's, what, that's right. We go to the high, <laughs> you know, we still go back to Jerusalem as the center of all this. Even in the midst of spreading the, wor you know, the word to Gentiles and further and further out, we go back to Jerusalem. Um, so as we're thinking about this question, and we know that this is going to be a struggle as we're forging a new path, spreading the gospel to the Gentiles, um, do we think this is more about integrity and truth and keeping faithful to the gospel, or is it about power and control? 
power and control. Yeah. Jan was like, yes, the power and control, power and control. Um, well, let's talk about that. Well, why is that among um, religious leaders at that time? Dare I say, now at this time? So they needed to um, spread the gospel. That's what they believed in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a priority. So they need, maybe they felt they needed power to enforce that. But they've lost so much power. They've lost so much power and control. The Pharisees, they're used to being top dogs, and then all of a sudden they're not. Right. And they're trying to figure out a way to be top dogs again, even though I don't know that it's a conscious thing sometimes. It can be an unconscious thing. It, it's just that if you're craving that power and control, you'll do it any way you can do it. Plus, there's a part of them probably saying, if I had to go through this, you got to go through it too. <laughs> <laughs> How many times have we heard that argument about things? <laughs> You know, it reminds me very much of baptism. You know, like if you don't baptize our way, you're not going to count. Yeah. It, it doesn't count unless you're dunked. That's right. Yeah. Which means yeah. I was never yeah. baptized. It's the same sort of argument, I think. Yes. Um, and I think also, you know, when people ask hard questions mm -hmm. and you don't have Jesus sitting there right there in front of you, how do you know the true answer? This is, I mean, the, all of this is about how do you make these decisions? How do you go forward in such newness of faith? That's a big question. So we're seeing it play out in lots of different ways. So how did the Gentiles get included in the first place? Because the, the Holy Spirit came down on them. You know, the, the Jewish were already circumcised as children at eight days old. When the Holy Spirit came upon them, um, so with the Holy Spirit going onto the Gentiles without all this, with their sinful food, <laughs> that should tell you something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where did the Spirit go? Where did the Spirit go exactly? And I think something we've noticed in the last several chapters that we've studied is that we see the way God is orchestrating these events and these encounters, even as they are spreading to n different areas, different lands, further and further out, um, places they would normally not go. That is by God's orchestration. Mm -hmm. um, so seeing the divine at work is how, how, you know, how this is happening. So I think a reminder at this point is even in the midst of their struggles to remember who is the source of this. And God is the source of this in sharing the spirit and pouring the spirit out on more and more people. Um, and I think that's an important part to remember. So I found in my commentary today some questions that I thought were very appropriate because again, we're coming to this place because we are questioning and we're trying to figure out how to do this the best way. Um, and, and, and I think it also captures the newness of what they're trying to do. So he says, how do you capture in words the dynamic of life together? Not just life together, but a holy joining of life, the life of the spirit of God within our lives. How do you capture not simply a new movement, but a movement that always renews and makes new. And I think that those questions are as true for us today as they were for um, what, we're exper what we're reading about in the book of Acts. Um, they're, they're trying to figure out something new and um, it's about the joining of Jew and Gentile and a joining knowing that God's in the center of their lives. And so that leads us to questions. All right, well, let's move on to verses 12 through 21. Who wants to read those? I will. Thank you, Kay. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this as it is written. 
After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord who does these things. Things unknown from long ago. This is, how far do I go? Um, to the end of that paragraph, uh, verse 21. Okay. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted from, by idols and sexual immortality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in synagogues on every Sabbath. All right, so what evidence is presented as they're debating this out in Jerusalem? The word of the prophets. Yes, so we're hearing witness and testimony of everybody who's been out there uh, converting Gentiles and spreading the gospel. Um, so we're hearing their testimony of what they have witnessed in telling it to Gentiles. I mean, first, and if you think about this, is, but it's a, it's a firsthand account, but it's also we're talking about Gentiles, not with Gentiles. And I think that's an important um, thing to notice. Um, so who is going to make this decision? James. James. James is now in charge in Jerusalem, and he's the one that's going to make this decision. Um, what passage of the Bible does he quote from? This. Amos and Jeremiah, according yeah. to my my so we have this, yeah, so we have this passage from Amos, uh, maybe a little mixed in from, <laughs> Israel, uh, from Isaiah or something else. Um, so what does this passage help us to see? The, the phrase, and I will restore it, mm -hmm. so that the best of men may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. That was the important part. It's not... Yeah. It's not just you, you good guys, <laughs> everybody. So what decision ultimately does James make? That they should write to them and tell them to abstain from food polluted by idols and from sexual immortality and the meat strangled from, of strangled animals and from blood. So in the end, I mean, what kind of, um, what did they focus on? The law of Moses. How yeah. they're living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So basically a few of the laws. They, they basically gave you a top list of, these are the ones that make uh, Jewish Christians most uncomfortable. It's basically what they came down to. Yeah. And it's going to be communicated uh, by letter. So let's go ahead and read the next section. Who wants to read verses 22 through 35? I'll do it. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They closed, they chose Judas called Basabas and Silas, two men who were leaders among the brothers. With them, they sent the following letter to the apostles and elders, your brothers, to the gentle, Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia, greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So they <clears throat> all agreed to choose some men and sent them with you with our dear friends, Barnabas and Paul. Men you have risked their lives, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sent Judas and Silas to confirm the word of the mouth that we are writing. It seems good that the, to the Holy Spirit 
and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed by idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. Oh, how far? Um, go re read to 35. The men who were sent off and went down to Antioch, when they gathered the church together and delivered the letter, letter the people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the brothers. After spending some of the time with them, they were sent off by the brothers with the blessings of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch when they and many others taught and preached the word. All right. Some so I, like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. You're good. Great job. Thank you. Um, so James makes the decision and says there needs to be a letter. So how, how do they get this communication out? Take it. Barnabas and Paul and two others go to Antioch. Yep. So we, they choose representatives and the representatives are the ones that are going to take the letter and read it. And it sounds, you know, um, sounds similar to other letters you would read in the New Testament. Greetings, farewell, it's all clearly laid out. So we're seeing similar interaction in letters that they would, that we would see as forming the Christian, uh, you know, life in the New Testament. And so you got people out there to explain the letter, but everybody's reading the same letter. Um, that's what's going out. Um, so how does this feel as a conclusion? How is it received? How do you think how do you think this works as a conclusion to this problem at this point? I think all those men went <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Glad that was over. You know, I I always I'm sorry for the guys in the audience for the group here, but I, I think it's so interesting how God continually uses circumcision to get people's attention. <laughs> I mean, I talk about waking up a group you know and then and of course the women would have to take care of the men after they've been adult circumcised that's not a pretty picture so anyway i um when, like jody said when they found out they didn't have to be circumcised i think you could have told them anything at that point <laughs> 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 Any compromise worked, you know? I think it's a great compromise. Yeah. Um, how do you think this this helps the church to continue to move forward at this point? Well, they're more unified. They're not fighting over some of the issues. Mm -hmm. And they're all getting the same letter. And I, I don't think that can be said enough. You know, in that era, I think to get the same message is really hard to do, but important. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have TV speakers or whatever. So they're all on the same page. James. I think that's very good to hear. All right, we're gonna wrap up the end of chapter 15. Who would like to read verses 36 through 41? I will. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John called Mark along with them also, but Paul kept insisting that they should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left, being committed by the brethren to the grace of God, and he was traveling through Syria and Silica, strengthening the churches. Mm -hmm. So they're right, following so them on themselves. Yes. Yeah, so what what was Paul's plan? How did so we've had this, you know, they've gone, they've read the letter, there is relief among the men, there is some peace and unification going, okay, this is how we're gonna do this. What is Paul's plan? He's gonna go back to all the places they had been. 
yeah, they want to go back to all the places. So they want to keep strengthening the churches, keep in touch with the people. Um, they want to keep going. Um, but what actually occurs? Fight. Mark fight. was going to slack her. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, what, what what do you think the problem was with Mark? Because we don't have a lot of evidence. Well, Mark was immature. It's something I read in the past said that Mark had been very tied to his mother and his family. He was very young. So when he got frightened, he just wasn't grown up at that point. And Barnabas, I think, was willing to give him a break and say, mm -hmm. okay, you know, have you learned? Have you grown from this? Mm -hmm. And I think we think that um, that Barnabas may have been kin to Mark, so that might have been some of the reason to give the benefit of doubt, to give him another chance, to want to call him along. Um, but for Paul, what is what is the big issue with Mark? Because he left him before. He left. He left. He abandoned the work. He's he's he has declared he couldn't handle it. Because is this easy work that they are venturing into? No. 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 This is the most difficult work in uncharted territory. I mean, literally geographically and then um, figuratively in that you, you don't know what it is to spread the gospel except for what experience you've had thus far. But in every new place, it's a new problem, a new encounter, and they're still, they're still stuck in this newness of this faith and there are still many questions and there are still things that they are figuring out. So no part of this journey is easy. Um, and there are still things that they're, they're having to determine as they go along. Um, what, do you, what problem does this point to? Um, I mean, here we are seeing disagreements in the church again, nothing new. Um, this is still going on. Um, but what does this point to? What do, you, what, do you, what do you think Paul is really concerned about? Um, maybe keeping the people that have already converted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what it looks like, what their image is. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I was going to say, who else? I just think they, Paul's concerned about the, the job getting done. And if Silas, I mean, if Mark continues to leave, you know, they, they traveled with a wingman, as the old saying goes, because you needed somebody to help. Sort of. mm -hmm. And if your wingman leaves, then you're unprotected and it's just all complicated. So, but I, I think um, I read a long time ago and it kind of made sense to me that, that Barnabas and Paul shouldn't have been running around together anyway. You had these two very strong, strong leaders and they were going to the same places all the time together. And in the same way God took the Tower of Babel and spread everybody out, maybe God said, okay, we can cover more territory if Barnabas goes this way and Paul mm -hmm. goes that way. And it kind of made sense to me in a lot of ways. Well, and I, I think we can see this as, as exactly that. God is still working through what's happening amongst his leaders and those called to spread the gospel. And this might be, okay, we've got to get to more places. We've got to go to different places. We have to um, share our leadership wisely, you know. Um, maybe they weren't the best duo together. Um, but I think Paul is also pointing to and a very important thing, um, and y'all were all getting close to it, but I think this is about trust. Mm -hmm. We're doing some risky and difficult work, and this is about trust. Can the people hearing this news for the first time trust who's coming before them? So again, if we think somebody's going to leave, or desert and that doesn't look good and that looks divided, there's no trust. And that doesn't bode well for those new in faith. Um, but then also, like Jan was talking about, it's about trusting who you're with for safety, for care, um, as they're doing this role together. You need that sense of trust because there's going to be difficulties along the way and places where you need help. So I think this really highlights trust. So my question is, um, I think it calls us to ask what, what is necessary in our discipleship? What is necessary in our taking on leadership roles in the church today? 
What are the necessary things? Because maybe for Paul, this was saying, okay, a non-starter is I need to be able to trust you. And if you've shown me uh, reasons not to trust you, I can't give you leadership. So that was like a non-negotiable for Paul. Um, now, Barnabas obviously has a different relationship with Mark and he thinks he can make it work, but that's between the two of them. So for us, what are, the, what are those things? What are those non-negotiables? Um, what are those things we need for discipleship and leadership? I think you need okay. continuity. Dependability. Dependability. Mm -hmm. Like you said, trust and understanding. Mm -hmm. I think you need to feel too that you need to instinctually be aware of the power of the Holy Spirit is working within this person or in this situation. I mean, we all hear, I'll give the example of TV ministers and you're like, there's certain TV ministers and you're like, I can't change that channel quick enough. You know, it just doesn't feel right. So anyway. Which, which speaks to trust in relationship as well, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something we experience. Well, don't you think leadership has to, in some ways, have their fights behind closed doors? Like they went to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. so that they could talk to James in a big group. So when they came out, they were on the same page. Nothing's worse than everybody being on a different, when your leadership's on different pages, you don't know what to do. You don't know who to follow or where to go. And then people start picking sides mm -hmm. and then you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So in looking at this chapter where we're debating a huge issue for how the church will move forward with its mission to follow where the Holy Spirit and God's divine agency is working, um, to take it, take the gospel into all the lands and figure out what that means. And we're figuring about, and it looks like we're, you know, what are the rules? What are, uh, what is necessary? What, you know, how, what does this make you think about in your own walk um, and your own uh, understanding of church life? What, where Does this resonate anywhere else for you? Because sometimes when we read about Acts, it's like, okay, well, that was where. Yeah. I think at this current environment, we've all had to sit back and think, you know, church changed. Um, and, and this is a perfect example of where do we trust? Where's our dependability? Where are we going to the Lord? All of these questions. I think the environment's perfect for this right now in terms of understanding it. Because it's also confusing. Mm -hmm. That is certainly true. Well, I find it interesting that Paul wants to go back and say, I want to see how they're doing. So he's not just leaving them on his own. And that's what we as a church right now are trying to do is we can't, we don't have face to face contact, but we try to organize ourselves to go back to our members to let them know, oh, we care about you and how are you doing? So I see that as the similarity. And even a model for how we are to live life together as the church. Go check on one another. Mm -hmm. It's a sense, it's right there in what Paul was trying to do. And that's, that's a good lesson to look at. And, and Paul always had a disciple with him so that if need be, he, like he leaves disciples behind if he needs to. Mm -hmm. he's, he's taken it as a teaching opportunity too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he also had that accountability when he had that disciple with him. And to leave leadership in place. Sometimes they need to stay behind and, and continue that work to make sure everybody understands and to, to strengthen that group that, that is in that particular place. But isn't this the Wesley model? Isn't this what John Wesley did kind of? I mean, he did. I mean, he appointed lay preachers in various places. He created small groups for accountability. He was making sure leadership was always in place and that we had a, a way to check in with each other's souls 
um, and not just on a surface level, but on deep levels, so that that work of discipleship continued. Um, that's absolutely a Wesleyan model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Anything else that Acts 15 brings up for you? Uh, Heather, don't you think that in all of this, here, here were some who had been with Jesus. They, they'd been molded and shaped. Don't you think that when they went through all of this, that, that they went back to the supreme authority and they said, well, you know, what did Jesus, what did Jesus do? Uh, and, and the one thing that, that I've become increasingly aware of was uh, Jesus, by all stretch of the imagination, was probably a mystic. All right, how do we define a mystic? A mystic is a person that spends countless hours with God. They have a firsthand encounter. It's not second-handed. It wasn't something that somebody gave them, but 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 I think the question came had to, had to be with Peter and uh, uh, with all the disciples. They 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 remembered. They said, "Well, what how, how, what did Jesus give us, and what did He mean to us?" And 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 they repeatedly saw His example, uh, which kept coming back to them. You know, like Him walking through the the cornfield and plucking a grain of corn on a on a Sabbath, he mm -hmm. he broke the law, yet uh, he was he he was he was ushering in a new day. Mm -hmm. Hey, the new day is here. The kingdom of God, it's here. And but but the real thing to me is that I th I think I need to be a little bit more mystical in my relationship too. You know. That's the one thing that, that I think Jesus has passed on to all of us, you know, that, that uh, he said, here, you're, you have the same access to this God that I do. And uh, he didn't hesitate to spend countless, countless hours, but, but he, did, he, did, he never questioned God. He said, God is a reality in my life because I spent time with him. I came from him. I was there at the beginning with him, and uh, we're we're not we're not divine by any stretch of the imagination, but yet that mystical quality does does exist. I think that's true. I mean, I think you're right. That this is the leadership that they could offer is to say, "This is what I learned firsthand with Jesus," and that's an important thing to remember. And Jesus did model spending that time with God in communication, and then I think. Um, a lot of that was then transferred to where do we see the spirit at work? Where have we seen it poured out? So the experience of things was also an important touchstone for how do we stay in connection with God? Um, and I think those are important as they figure out things in this new way. Um, but also that maintaining the fellowship and the checking in with people. I always thought it was interesting that with all the disciples, that one of them wasn't left in charge of the Jerusalem church. That James was put in charge of the Jerusalem church. And we don't know how much James, we're assuming James is his brother, right? Is that, and we're, we don't know how much he was with him. We assume a lot, but he wasn't considered a disciple. Mm -hmm. And I mean, as such, not one of the 12, but anyway, <laughs> For that to be the ultimate authority in this passage fascinates me in a lot of ways. It wasn't Paul, it wasn't Peter, it wasn't any of them, it was James. So I think it's interesting how they saw something in James to put him in charge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the Holy Spirit. but And, and I, th I think that's also about, you know, calling who who could sustain the journey on the road better who who could be the evangelist and the sharer of the testimony and the witness and and bring it to the people that wasn't an easy um uh, qualifications <laughs> to have either so i think it's about gifts i think about the gifts of the holy spirit any other thoughts about acts 15 
Well, good. I'm going to turn off the recording.